Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, SSB Ground School. This is the uh, primary series, uh, so good for this is for primary training and glider. Um, we've invited uh, a number of, of students uh, who are not in SSB either now or yet. Maybe they will be uh, someday. Um, but uh, at any rate, welcome to everybody who's uh, working on your glider rating. And uh, this, uh, this ground school series uh, covers the topics in the glider flying handbook, the FAA's glider flying handbook. Uh, these are the things you need to know to pass your the oral part of your check ride, and, and also many things that you need to know uh, for flying gliders uh, and passing your, your, the flying part of your check ride, uh, even though this is ground school and not flight school. So uh, get your flight lessons from your flight instructor, uh, but the things you need to know uh, are, are covered here. And uh, so we cover the, the glider flying handbook. Uh, it is taught by two CFIG candidates, uh, Casey Meeks, who will primarily be speaking tonight, and then also uh, Jeff Clayton. Uh, both both are uh, career pilots, uh, excellent pilots. Uh, they, uh, I, I had the pleasure of training both of them uh, for their glider add-ons to their commercial licenses, and um, and that was uh, that was a great joy. I learned a lot from from these two gentlemen, and I think you all will too. So, um, any rate. Uh, Casey, you want to just take it over and, and, and jump in and talk a little bit about what topics you're going to talk about and then uh, and then carry it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ramon. Uh, today, we're going to cover chapters five and seven. Uh, so chapter five, we'll start off with is glider performance, uh, and then we'll talk about operations um, in chapter seven as well. Chapter seven is a bit of a long uh, chapter, but it has a really nice tie up to chapter five glider performance. So if you're scratching your head a little bit after uh, the start of this one, then we'll we'll probably cover it again in chapter seven. Armand, can you allow uh, screen sharing? Go ahead, it should work now. There we go. Um, all right. All right, let me arrange my windows so I can see everything all right. Very good. All right, so chapter five takes us through uh, glider performance. And we wanna keep in mind that there are four factors that will affect performance. And those include density altitude, the weight of the aircraft, the design of the aircraft, which we can't uh, do too much about. Uh, and then of course the, uh, the wind will, will alter performance as well. So let's talk about density altitude. Uh, density altitude is different than the actual altitude that you would have at an airport. Um, and the uh, effective altitude of, of an airport or operations increase, uh, obviously the higher we get because we have lower atmospheric pressure Temperature has a great effect on density altitude and as well as humidity. So um, a quick example, uh, looking here at, uh, at Boulder. Um, this, was a, this is a pretty typical day in Boulder. And we see there that um, the density altitude on this day with a temperature of uh, 26 degrees C, which is 79 degrees Fahrenheit, yields a density altitude of over uh, 7,400 feet. So when we consider that, it's like the, the same as being at a standard day at 7,400 feet, which definitely uh, affects the performance of our aircraft. We can actually get lower than normal density altitudes in airport, airport as well if we have really cold, dry air, uh, and then we have our standard atmosphere. And then other factors affecting density altitude uh, could be uh, considered a warm, moist air mass. Uh, humidity actually plays a, a pretty big role in density altitude. And if you think about it, we have a parcel of air. And if that parcel of air uh, is very humid, there's going to be more water molecules in that parcel of air. And that will actually separate those air molecules out, making the air less dense. So that will uh, affect the, uh, the aircraft in quite a few ways. Increased weight. Uh, this is one factor that pilots uh, can control themselves. Increased weight obviously decreases takeoff and climb performance. So it's going to be a longer takeoff roll behind the tug. 
and climb performance is going to be decreased. Uh, interestingly, it will increase the high speed cruise performance while maintaining the glide ratio. It actually shifts the polar down and to the right. But when we calculate our uh, glide ratio from that, we actually see that we have the same glide ratio, it just happens at a higher speed. Uh, during launch, a heavy glider will take much longer to accelerate the flying speed. You'll have a higher stall speed indicated. We'll talk a lot about um, stall speeds. Remember that stall, uh, it, we see it as a speed in the, uh, in the glider, but really it's a critical angle of attack. So it's simply reaching that critical angle of attack uh, earlier because of that higher weight at a higher airspeed. Um, it will it'll create a higher minimum controllable airspeed. You will have a higher sink rate and uh, you'll, you'll circle a larger diameter because of that higher speed in thermals. So uh, big effect there. Also the stall speed, the minimum controllable airspeed, the minimum sink airspeed of a glider all increase with the increased weight of a glider. And it's actually pretty easy to calculate that. We can, we can simply uh, figure out the weight of increase from standard weight, uh, figure out the square root of that, and then add that square root result to our stall speed to calculate our new spirit. Uh, stall speed. So kind of an important concept, uh, especially when you're preparing for your oral uh, to understand uh, those effects. Uh, wind. Uh, wind uh, affects our performance, especially controllability. Um, if we think about flying through an air mass, really doesn't matter what the wind is doing, whether we have a headwind or a tailwind as far as how the aircraft um, performs. However, what we're really concerned about here is wind gradient. When we use the term wind gradient, what we're talking about is the difference in the free flow airstream up at altitude. And as we get closer to the ground because of surface friction, that, uh, that airspeed is, uh, is going to decrease. And so that wind gradient is really important to keep in mind. Um, to, uh, to accommodate for this, what we typically do is we add roughly uh, uh, half of the wind and all of the gust factor to our yellow triangle in the glider or our approach speed. So let's say it was uh, 10 gusting to 15 knots. In that case, we would add five knots of approach speed for the uh, wind, that's half the wind. And we would add another five knots uh, for the gust, the 10 gusting to 15. So we'd wanna fly our approach speed at 10 knots above the uh, approach speed or what we see in our aircraft is the yellow triangle. So uh, really important. What that does is that allows us to carry more total energy through that uh, wind gradient and it allows us to have uh, more controllability during gusts or wind shears to have control of the aircraft all the way to the ground. So this will take us into uh, a talk about polars. Um, when we talk about polars, uh, each aircraft that you fly, each uh, glider especially is gonna have uh, polars. And we actually looked at polars the last time we talked. Uh, it's basically where that, uh, that total lift bucket uh, meets itself. So the place where the parasitic drag and the induced drag uh, meet to create the least amount of drag uh, on that aircraft. And that would be the top of our polar. Now we flipped it around and we want to understand how that affects the performance of our aircraft. So on this uh, left side, let me see if I can Is there a laser pointer available? Yeah, up on the top there where it shows your sh screen sharing. Or sh oh, you, you yeah. got it. Yeah, you got it. You see the red dot there? Well, you had it. I you had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I can still see your black. Uh, there you go. Now you got the red dot. Excellent. Cool. So when we look at a polar, uh, this indication right here is going to be our sink rate, the vertical side. So uh, increasing sink downwards and the horizontal is our airspeed and not. So all of our polars are laid out the same way. And there's two very important airspeeds that we want to determine from that. And one is going to be minimum sink. So minimum sink is basically that, um, that perfect spot where we have the least amount of drag on the aircraft. And minimum sink is determined from the polar by extending a horizontal line from the top of the polar right here. So we find the apex of the polar and come straight across. Uh, and we see, uh, we see our, um, our minimum sink rate. And we also can tell at what airspeed that happens. So it looks like this aircraft would be just above 40 knots, maybe, maybe 40, 41 knots, um, with a sink rate of approximately 1.7 knots. 
LD max uh, is determined by taking a line and drawing it tangentially from the origin. Uh, so the origin in this case is going to be zero. And so we draw a line, a straight line that just barely touches that polar. And that spot where it touches the polar uh, is the place where we have LD max. And we can again determine by looking at our chart that that's going to happen at 50 knots and uh, sync rate maybe just above uh, two knots in that case. We can determine what that glide ratio is by taking our speed uh, divided by the sync rate, which in this case is going to be 50 divided by 2.1, which is going to give us a glide ratio of 24.1, and that's going to happen at 50 knots. So two very important concepts to understand with that. Um, we also want to understand that um, the effect of, uh, of a tailwind uh, and, and what that can do for us. Um, so the speed to fly in a tailwind lies somewhere between minimum sync uh, and uh, LD max, but never slower than minimum sync. So we'll, we'll take a, a closer look at that in chapter seven when we talk about practical applications, uh, but understand that um, that will affect our, our speed to fly slightly. Cool. And one of the things that we just haven't covered in there is, is uh, speed to fly theory and McCready theory. So we'll get into to that a little bit later. Cool. Some of the other factors uh, that affect aircraft performance is weight and balance. Very important to calculate the weight and balance uh, of the aircraft uh, to make sure that we're flying uh, it, it as efficiently as possible. Um, tail heaviness can make uh, the pitch control of the glider difficult or impossible. Um, so we want to make sure that that we we don't have that. And then if the if it's too nose heavy, uh, if we're too far forward on our envelope, it can make it uh, difficult to flare. Keep in mind that there is a very simple formula for calculating the CG, and that's weight times arm equals moment. That's a that's something that you may have to calculate. So we can always take uh, the weight that we're adding. There will be a listed arm or a distance for that condition, and it'll give us a total moment. And then we can always take the total moment. That'll be a very large number divided by the total weight to find our CG position. And that's in inches uh, aft or forward, usually aft in reference to a datum. Um, most of the gliders that you'll fly, most of the training gliders are very insensitive to weight and balance because they're two place uh, aircraft. And so what that does for us is it gives us a very wide CG range. But Jeff, you actually fly the discus quite a bit. Can you talk a little bit about the effects of uh, weight and balance and ballast uh, on that uh, single sheet, seat uh, aircraft? Sure. Uh, like you said, uh, since it's a single seat, it's a little more subject, um, a little tighter uh, CG, acceptable CG location. Mm. And in, in my case, uh, I weigh about 155 pounds. I actually have to add some, some nose ballast in. And uh, if if I don't do that, uh, I in fact forgot one time on a flight and it was very, um, um, it, the handling was very um, difficult at slow speeds and it, it made me you know, nervous about landing. So I landed with some extra speed. Okay. So it affected, affected the handling in terms and it also affected uh, flaring. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the ASK-21, I haven't done it before, but may, Armand, maybe you could talk about that. In order for us to do spin training in that aircraft, we actually have to add tail ballast, don't we? Yes. Cool. What's that process like and about how much weight does that take to effectively move uh, to an aft CG where this aircraft? Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the K-21, uh, on the K-21, there is a hole <laughs> in the tail uh, in the, the, the vertical tail of the glider. And you take a, uh, you take a bar, there's a special, you know, bolt, bar bolt that goes through there. And then you add these weights on. Uh, the weights, of course, depend on a little bit on the weight of the, of the front seat pilot. But uh, typically you're gonna add uh, one, two, three, three, three about uh, six or seven kilograms to the tail, which really uh, lightens up that, that lightens up the, the nose of the aircraft uh, yeah. and, and makes it pretty bouncy. The when you're under tow, when you're doing that spin training and you're under tow, uh, it's, it's 
it's an odd feeling. And yeah. Casey, you and I are going to have to go up and do spin training, I guess, as part of your CFIG. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll go do that. Yeah. yeah. With the K21, uh, you can get it to spin several times. Uh, mostly when I've done it, though, it'll do about three quarters of a, of a turn and then it degrades into a spiral dive, which yeah. is. Uh, really picks up speed fast and gets your attention. Yeah, absolutely. And for the students here, um, as you're flying the aircraft uh, and you're calculating uh, CG, especially if you're flying the ASK-21, there's some very simple chase charts and just verify that the, the front pilot's within limits, the aft pilot's within limits. And, you know, it, it's, it's very, very simple. It's really easy to make sure that, you know, that you're within weight and balance. However, on your check ride, um, I would highly suggest actually calculating a moment and a, and a CG position and have that ready. So it's a good exercise to be able to do that. So recommend working with your instructor a few times to, to understand what that math is like. It's pretty simple uh, and pretty straightforward, but that really impresses the examiner uh, when you can show them that you know exactly how that process works and can calculate your CG exactly. Let's see. Cool. All right. So uh, with that, that's a really quick review of uh, chapter five. I'm going to jump into chapter seven. There's actually quite a quite a bit that uh, that moves between those two chapters, uh, unless there's any questions here. All right, and can everyone see the chapter seven? Yeah, it's coming through fine. Okay, cool. So uh, this is a big chapter, and this one is interesting. It, it's it's just titled. Uh, what's that? Cool. Sorry, trying chapter to get my headset to work. Oh no problem. Uh, so chapter seven is titled. Um, launch and recovery procedures and maneuvers. And let's talk about this. This is kind of a neat chapter if we think about it as, uh, you know, from the very start of a flight uh, all the way to the end of a flight uh, and everything that could kind of happen in between and to consider. A lot of what I'll be talking about tonight is tailored specifically to uh, to Boulder and Boulder operations, which I hope is good for, for most people here. But uh, just keep in mind that the procedures uh, are very localized. It really depends a lot on the airport, the available ramp space, uh, and other traffic there. Um, we had had a, a great time a couple weekends ago down at Salida, and that was really neat for Jeff and I to go fly somewhere different and operate at us somewhere di we're different because all the towing procedures were were pretty different uh, and outside of what we were comfortable with outside of Boulder. So, so that was good. Um, the checklist that you see on the right uh, is, is a typical checklist that we have mounted in most of the club aircraft, and there's a, a, a checklist for takeoff and landing. Checklists are very, very, very important in aviation. Obviously, we can get very comfortable in a, in a sailplane. It's, it's relatively simple, uh, but very important to step through this each and every time uh, with every aircraft type that you, that you fly. So the first thing uh, we're going to do, obviously, is push the aircraft out. Jeff, you, I'm sure you talked about ground operations uh, last week, I think. Yes, we, we covered that. Cool. All right. So we'll pick up there, assuming we got ourselves out to the runway and uh, we will start to settle ourselves and get uh, and get strapped in and make sure that, that everything's good here. A very uh, critical, this is a very critical time uh, here that you're, you need to do the, this checklist in a very ordered way and without interruption. Uh, there's a lot going on. You've got a lot of straps and, and, um, your parachute and, and someone trying to hook you up and other traffic and maybe rushed. But this is a great time uh, not to have conversations unrelated to flying. Uh, and if someone is assisting you and trying to help you out here, you can certainly ask them to just give you a few minutes to, to go through this checklist. So the first thing we want to look at is the wind. In Boulder, we always want some component of east. Um, we'll talk a little bit about west wind toes in a little bit, but west wind toes in Boulder can be relatively violent and require a special checkout uh, to be able to solo on those. So uh, if you're in a training environment, you always want some component of east, which is normal diurnal flow uh, in Boulder. Um, you wanna uh, make sure that um, you visually check the controls are free and correct. Um, the dolly has been removed and visually checked. That's an important one. Uh, 
it, it could be very, very easy to forget to take off the uh, tail dolly and then take off with it on, which would give you a very FCG and extremely high drag. And Armand, I'm sure there's stories of that happening before, isn't haven't, aren't there? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so we want to be cautious of that. And if you can visually check if you did use a tail dolly and a wing dolly, if you can watch someone take those off or take them off yourself and then visually see them in a pile away from the aircraft that always gives that that last final assurance that it's not actually attached. We want to set our trim before takeoff really depends on the aircraft. Typically, we would set the trim to be more uh, forward more uh, than normal. Um, just just a little bit forward of neutral. If we, uh, I, I think in this takeoff regime, it's better to have positive control when pulling back on the stick than to be too trim too far back and then have to push forward. We can easily get ourselves into an oscillation in that way. So I usually use a relatively neutral to forward trim uh, setting for takeoff. We want to make sure our ballast is not installed, or if it is installed, we want to make sure that it is appropriate for our CG condition. Put your straps on, make sure that you're totally secure. Instruments, we uh, hopefully already checked our radio transponder and altimeter, but this is a great time to check it one more time to make sure that it's set correctly. We'll then check our air brakes for uh, operation, pull those all the way out, take a look at them and stow them, making sure that you completely lock them uh, in the closed position uh, for your takeoff. Uh, canopies aft and front, we want to verify those are locked. Uh, so make sure that that you've locked those and then physically reach up and push up on it to make sure that you can't move those open. And then I really uh, think a good thing to do is to, in our emergencies, and especially a boulder, to recite uh, what's going to happen early on. Uh, Clemens provided us a great video that we'll take a look at in just a moment. But recite the straight ahead Elliott's field, L-shaped field. That'll make a lot more sense here in a moment. And then uh, do a traffic check. It can be very difficult to check for traffic when you're strapped in. You can see very little behind you at this point, but hopefully you've been listening to the radio this whole time to make sure that you understand what's happening. We don't want to go wings level and begin to tow if there's somebody on final already. All right, the connection. So uh, the connection, the club aircraft use uh, what's called a toast ring, T-O-S-T. And that's that ring that you see there. It looks like a, a welded ring around another ring. Uh, it's the small part that goes into the connection on the aircraft. That's connected to the uh, to the tow line with a with some sort of a, um, a knot. We actually use what's called a bowline knot, which is illustrated here. We want to inspect that connection before we connect it to our aircraft. Typically, whoever's assisting you is going to uh, offer you the tow ring, and you'll look at it and just make sure that there's no excessive necking or pinching of this knot. Um, there's an excellent, excellent uh, resource available for us on the uh, web page, uh, and that's the tow rope with Mike Exner. And I watched that a few days ago, and that was just an excellent uh, resource to understand uh, why these, why a tow uh, rope might break, and what they look like, and when we should retire them. So just because it made the last tow okay, uh, doesn't mean that it's going to make it through this tow okay. And Armand, you had a, a rope break recently, didn't you? uh not that i recall oh yeah um yeah okay i recall it now it was uh it wasn't real dramatic because uh the rope broke as soon as the tow plane started uh moving and i accused the uh the the pilot in the front seat of pulling the release which he did, <laughs> <laughs> which he did not do uh, yeah <laughs> but I was giving the hairy eyeball like, yeah, you must have, but uh, must have. yeah, but anyway, any rate, no, the ring was still, <laughs> I got out of the glider and the ring was still in there. So I was like, yeah, you're right. The rope broke. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that rope was overworn and that incident, uh, then we retied it and then it broke again the same way with the glider barely moving. Yeah. Uh, and then we said, ooh, let's throw this rope away. Um, and then we kind of, Mike Exner got involved and uh, we retain, we, <clears throat> the retying, uh, we put serious restrictions on that. We don't retie a rope unless it's brand new. You know, yeah. if it breaks right away, then we'll retie it. But if it breaks because it's breaking, we don't want to retie it and continue to use it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So that's a great time to have a, a rope break. Um, we'll see other options for rope breaks here in the video here. And then of course, in your training, you're going to have 
uh, low return rope breaks. Um, we typically sort of have some checkpoints that we'll see in the video, um, but if you're above about 200 feet and you haven't yet crossed over the quarry, uh, you can typically do a 180 degree turn back to the uh, airport. Um, and so you'll practice that, uh, I don't know, you'll practice it quite that low, but probably 300 feet um, and making it back around uh, from a simulated rope uh, uh, from a break. So it's important to be familiar with the, the uh, the uh, hand signals associated with tow. Um, I would probably say this check controls isn't something that you would typically see, but it's something that you could be asked about on your uh, on your oral. So that you may, whoever's assisting you may ask you to check your controls and they'll move their, their thumb through a circle. The other signal that you'll see all the time is the open tow hook uh, and then the closed tow hook, usually followed with an oral command as well. So that's when we pull the release, let them insert the uh, toast connection here. Uh, and then close the tow hook. And after they close that connection, uh, it's nice to see them give that rope a big tug to make sure that it's uh, well connected to the aircraft. So um, from that uh, presentation, this is a great example of a rope that is ready for retirement. Uh, so these ropes uh, meet a certain tensile strength and it really depends um, on the type of rope and, and how they, they choose to use it. There's lots of different ways to, to create what we call this weak link. But the weak link here at the glider end must have a minimum strength of 80% of the glider's max certificated operating strength, and it must have a maximum strength of twice the maximum certificated operating weight. So um, pretty big margin there, uh, which is good because getting this to break exactly uh, uh, at, a, at a required spot can be very difficult uh, with these types of rope because it really depends on age. Uh, on the... Uh, toe plane end, the strength requirement is to be equal to or greater, but not more than 25% greater than that of the link on the glider end, and not more than twice the maximum certificated operating weight of the gliders in that case, no more than uh, 1,400 pounds. So um, important to understand what that looks like, and I really recommend uh, taking a look at that video to understand those, those uh, strength requirements um, and, and what you get from a new rope. Uh, just for SSB reference, this is pretty interesting. Uh, this is the chart that we had in there that we can see uh, that uh, the 80% uh, on uh, five Papa Bravo, 122 uh, pounds of breaking strength, and a max weak link strength of uh, the discus is 1,500 pounds. So, you know, in this case, we'd want to tie our weak link and have a rope that breaks, um, you know, somewhere about 1,400 pounds or so would be ideal but pretty difficult to get it to, uh, to hit that every single time. So something to be prepared for. So now we've got ourselves uh, connected. We're, uh, we've done our checklist, we're, we're totally ready. Your, uh, whoever's assisting you will wave their arm through an arc here, uh, slowly back and forth through an arc to take up slack. Now keep in mind that a lot of time this happens while you're getting ready. Um, so don't, don't be too disturbed. And then uh, when you've got just about the right amount of tension in there and that line's almost straight, then they're gonna hold their arm straight out uh, and steady. Hey, Jeff, can you give us an idea of what that looks like to you from the tow plane when you're looking back? How do you see what's going on behind you when you're 200 feet ahead of us? Yeah, um, I often wondered how the tow pilot could see me when I was a wing runner. And there's a little mirror and uh, you kind of got to crane your neck the right way. And if the wing runners too far to the side you can't see them yeah um, you know so it's, it's basically just that they have to be kind of at least um sometimes if they're at, at the tip it's a little hard to see them so okay. great cool and can you see how much tension you've taken up very well or is that yes that, that's not too hard to see they actually you know can can kind of see when you've got the tension um fully out at least once the line is getting close to being fully out yeah another thing that's really hard to see um is the rudder movement so make your rudder movements kind of slow and deliberate mm -hmm. you know it's better to do it back and forth um you know deliberately than to just rapidly cycle them and of yeah. course you know a good wing runner is going to give the, the 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 signal for um ready to launch yeah perfect Good. So before departure, uh, once you're you're totally buttoned up there, you're going to look at your wing runner and give them a thumbs up, indicating that all checklists are complete. 
and that you think the traffic is clear, they're going to verify that traffic is clear much easier to determine uh, from outside the aircraft than it is inside. If they give you a thumbs down, they're, it's probably because somebody's on final. So, so don't uh, be too discouraged by that. You're still going to go flying, but just wait a moment. You'll probably see that traffic. And then once it's clear, they'll give you the thumbs up and they'll bring that wingtip to the level position if we're doing an assisted takeoff. Um, and then, of course, we want to make our radio call uh, in the SSB. We, we tell them uh, that we're prepared, our billing initials, uh, usually three letter initials, and uh, the direction of tow. And then, of course, we want to move our rudder fully side to side uh, during that call. And our wing runner is going to give this great big uh, takeoff signal um, with their arm. And hopefully they can see that. And we used a term there, uh, assisted takeoff. So assisted takeoff means that you have a wing runner, which is nice. Uh, but you will also practice unassisted takeoff. So that means that you're going to start with your wing on the ground. And we'll talk about the proper procedure for setting up for an unassisted takeoff uh, with a crosswind or without a crosswind in just a little bit. Emergency procedures, hopefully you don't ever see this, uh, but this could be seen well from, uh, from the uh, tow plane. Uh, wave your arms. Uh, that means stop operation immediately. Uh, this just means stop and then release the tow line or cut the tow line now, draw the arm across the throat. So maybe if that wing runner saw a problem coming or we had to get out or something was wrapped around uh, an obstacle there, you might, might ask, uh, be asked to release the tow line there in that case. Obviously, radios are great too, so use the radios uh, during those emergency procedures as well. There are several in-flight signals that are really important to be able to interpret, um, and we can really break those down into signals that we're going to see from the tow plane and then signals uh, that we can give to the tow plane. So the signals that are important to be able to interpret from the tow plane is uh, the uh, tow plane fanning the rudder. So if you're if they take off and start moving their tail around like crazy, they're saying something's wrong, something that you probably see pretty early in that tow. And uh, it, it's probably that your air brakes uh, popped open it's creating excessive drag and the tow plane doesn't think they're meeting the performance that they should in that case. So uh, be really uh, mindful uh, of that. If you see wagging the tail, check your air brakes, make sure there's nothing else wrong uh, with your aircraft. And then if they uh, don't like the tow at any plane, the tow plane is gonna rock their wings. Uh, this is actually a really easy to see signal. Um, I, think, uh, I think John and all the tow pilots do a really great job of making this very uh, plane. They're really big wing rocks, more than something that you would see in turbulence. Very large, very deliberate, and that means release immediately. So you'll see that um, on your check ride, probably. You'll probably see it um, in training a couple times, uh, and uh, uh, the instructors are pretty sneaky getting that signal to your uh, to your tow pilot. So be able to interpret those two uh, those two signals from the tow plane. We can also give signals. Can I add one one thing, one note of caution here. Uh, oh when you see the rudder waggle. So think of that like you're being, he's kind of slapping you in the face with the rudder waggle. And that means, hey, buddy, check it out. Check out what's wrong with your glider. Um, so, you know, uh, waggle is wrong. Rock is release. So if he rocks the wings, you release. Uh, if you release, if you're on your check ride, and the and the glider whack and the tow plane waggles the rudder and you release you will flunk the check ride that's a flunk um, if he rocks the wings and you don't release that is also a flunk so uh, make sure you get that straight uh, instructors know that when you're showing a rudder waggle do not show it low because the student might release <laughs> so make sure you're high enough to get back to the airport so be careful yeah. with this one. This is one where you can check you, you can flunk your check ride. Um, make sure you know those two signals. Cool, great points, Armand. Uh, so we can give some signals to the uh, tow plane as well. Um, if we uh, yaw the aircraft repeatedly, that's a signal to decrease the tow airspeed. That's saying, uh, hey, you're towing me too fast. Um, it's, it's actually kind of rare to get towed too fast, especially up, up here. Um, I don't know that I've ever been towed too fast, um, but Jeff, you were recently, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, actually on a cross country tow, I felt like, uh, you know, yeah. given the turbulence of the conditions, it, it got a little bit unnerving. Yeah, it, it's, it's different than just flying the glider at that speed. When yeah. you're towed, 
at an excessive speed that the glider wouldn't, you know, if you were just flying the glider, but not on toe, it's, it's a different feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, and one thing, and, and I'll say this for the, for our, our, the students who are at mile high, if you get towed too fast in the 233, the controls get really stiff. So um, it's very hard to move the controls when uh, you're getting towed too fast. So that is something you may want to practice uh, at mile high with the 233 if you get slow, if you get uh, towed too fast. Uh, and I have been towed too fast even in my, in my ship. Um, yeah. yeah, it can happen. Cool. And then uh, if we want them to increase the tow airspeed, we can walk, uh, rock our wings repeatedly. So uh, not a great graphic on that, but um, if you rock your wings, you want them to increase the speed, which I've definitely been towed too slow. And you can feel like uh, the aircraft gets very mushy and it becomes very, very difficult to, to stay in a proper tow position if you're being towed too slowly. So um, be uh, very familiar with those signals. Some of the other signals that, um, that we can have See if I can advance one. Cool. Um, we we can also maybe change the heading of the toe, and so I think this is open for debate here. So <laughs> this is what comes directly out of the glider flying handbook. Uh, this means if we pull the tail to the right, that's saying toe plane, please turn right, uh, and if you pull the toe plane tail to the left, it means toe plane, please turn left. However, I, I would say this probably isn't going to work in a lot of cases. Um, because what you're really doing is if you move off to the right significantly, you're going to pull the toe plane no left. And that's actually maybe an indication to them that you want to start turning towards that direction. So Armand, wouldn't you say that this one would be easily misinterpreted in a yeah, lot of cases? Yeah, a lot of instructors think that there's a typo in this. Oh yeah. Because when you pull the tail to the right, you're pointing it the, the nose to the left. And that pretty much tells them you want to go left. Yeah. Um, a radio call is, is a little more civilized than yanking the tail around. Uh, but yeah, that, that is uh, in the glider flying handbook. I do believe as many instructors do that that is a, a typo error. It yeah. should say glider pulls toe plane tail to right. That means <laughs> toe plane, please turn left. Yeah, and I can only imagine maybe if, the, if that is correct, they were thinking, well, the tow plane will always adjust to be directly ahead of the of the uh, sail plane. But yeah, I think in practice, this one doesn't work. However, this is how it's written. So if you're asked that oral question, I think I would answer uh, the book uh, format in this case. Well, I, no, I'd give the I'd give the right I, I I'd give the correct answer if you get at that. Well, um, I think you, I think you could discuss I say something? how that could be misinterpreted here. Yep. Hello. Yeah, Danny, so, go ahead. There is an errata published for that. If you Google on the FA website for that uh, for glider handbook, you keep looking, there is an errata published, and it shows that that is what you're looking at is wrong, and they show the correct answer, which is, of course, the one you are talking about. Cool. All right, we'll look that up. All right. So uh, initial takeoff, in the initial takeoff role, uh, it's important to uh, understand that the sailplane is going to uh, probably become airborne before the tow plane. In this case, it's important that we just barely become airborne, and then we need to fly level uh, two to four feet AGL. The risk here, of course, is we've got lots of performance and that we could, uh, we could balloon up over uh, the top of the tow plane. Of course, if we pulled up over the top of the tow plane, that's going to force the uh, the tail up and the nose down of the tow plane. So very important to control this. Again, that's another reason to make sure CG is appropriate. Uh, and uh, also that um, uh, that our trim is set appropriately so that we're not surprised as soon as we become airborne. Um, as soon as we take off, it's very important to set a crab angle into the wind. That term crab means uh, like a, you know, like a crab, like walking sideways. Um, and so we want to be able to crab into the wind so that our track is straight down the runway until we're clear of obstacles. You'll see in Boulder, especially in some of the videos, that um, there's a lot going on. There's other gliders there. And then you've got the mile high shack that's coming up quick and all their gliders. So very important to track that uh, center line. 
Um, we typically are going to set that crab angle with rudder and then control our bank angle with the ailerons uh, in this initial part of the tow. Uh, of course, if you lose sight of the tow plane in this initial part of the tow or really any time during the tow, we would want to release immediately in that case. I don't know why this won't advance for me. There we go. Cool. Um, for crosswind takeoff, let's see, unassisted takeoff. So we talked about the concept of unassisted takeoff. And unassisted takeoff um, is one where you don't have a wing runner. Let's talk about the case if this was no wind or wind was straight down the runway. In this case, we'd want to position uh, slightly off the runway heading by 10 to 20 degrees with one of the wings on the ground. If the uh, glider is uh, canned to the right, we put the right wing down. And if the glider is canned to the left, we put the left wing down. And you can imagine what happens here uh, is the tow plane starts accelerating. Uh, the wing that's on the ground, which is also trailing, is going to accelerate at a slightly faster rate than the other wing, which is going to create a very nice arc and create a little more airspeed to make it level very quickly. So um, that's a, a really easy technique and works really, really well, especially in something like the ASK. I think it really takes only maybe uh, one or two seconds to get the, uh, the, the wing that's on the ground to start rising. Crosswind takeoffs are really just another variant of that. There's typically gonna be some sort of crosswind component uh, associated with each takeoff. Um, and it's important to distinguish between assisted and unassisted. Um, if you have a uh, wing assist, that wing assist can help by holding the upwind wing slightly low. Uh, we got to, to, to take off in some really, really strong winds down in Salida, like 30 plus knots. And uh, it was really helpful with even a, a very marginal crosswind there to make sure that the upwind wing was low so it didn't get caught immediately as you started rolling. You can start off with full aileron into the wind as the takeoff roll is started because the ailerons at this point are ineffective. However, as you get aileron effectiveness, it's important to come back to a position that's, uh, that will allow us to maintain control and keep that upwind wing slightly low. We're going to control our takeoff path with the rudder, and uh, we want to make sure that we're not skipping. If you're skipping, that's a great indication that that upwind wing is too high and that the aircraft is starting to lift prematurely and coming back down on the runway. So if you feel a series of skips, be sure to hold that upwind wing slightly lower uh, during that initial roll to prevent that. After takeoff, obviously, we're going to go back to that previous uh, discussion about crabbing into the wind and tracking the center line. If we do an unassisted crosswind launch, it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit more difficult, but, but not, no big deal. We just want to place the glider on the upwind side of the runway because we might get pushed uh, by the wind slightly downwind. So that might put us towards the center line rather than off the runway. And then place the upwind wing on the ground with the glider 20 to 30 degrees into the wind. And then the unassisted procedure is very similar to what we talked about before. On the climb out, uh, we've really got two available toe positions. We have a high toe position and a low toe position. So uh, high toe position isn't high on the toe plane, it's high above the wake. So we can see where the typical wake profile will be. And we just wanna fly so we're just outside of that wake. Uh, it's important, you can actually feel the burble of the toe as you climb out. So sometimes you can feel the top of the wake as you descend into it. So if you feel a little bit of burbling over the wings, it means you're slightly too low. So raise your position and then kind of lock in what that sight picture looks like. Most times when we do an aero, aero toe climb out, um, we'll, we'll more or less bisect the toe plane uh, with the horizon. And so uh, just figure out what that looks like. It's actually pretty different between our cub and our, uh, and our uh, Pawnee, I think. Um, and so I kind of look for slightly different things uh, with each of those aircraft to make sure I'm in the proper toe position. You could also fly in a low toe position, but that's it's not super typical. You'll you'll obviously do that when we do a maneuver called boxing the wake, um, but it's probably not a preferable way to tow. There are some efficiencies associated with that. Uh, by um, it actually does increase performance slightly by decreasing the amount of pressure that the horizontal or the elevator has uh, to set the angle of attack on the wing. But there are some potential uh, faults here. You could have fouling. So if this tow plane release, you could uh, potentially foul the glider with that, uh, with that as well. So typically, low, long, low tow positions are reserved for uh, like a long cross country or something where um, where you just have to be in a more comfortable position for a long time. It's also important to follow the arc of the tug. 
Um, so again, we put the tug on the horizon and then during a turn, we want to make sure that we're aiming at the outside wingtip to make sure that our track stays the same as the, uh, as the tow plane track. With a 200 foot rope, and as soon as the tow plane makes a turn, we're gonna also have to make that turn within two seconds. So uh, very important to watch that tow plane and repeat that, uh, that same maneuver as closely as possible. If you don't follow the same uh, rate of turn and you, you, uh, you turn faster than the tow plane, then you're actually gonna turn inside the tug uh, and you are going to start slowing down and you could develop a slack line at that point. So um, if you're, if you're, if you feel like you're turning inside, uh, you need to uh, decrease your bank angle to get back into that, uh, that tow path. Alternatively, if you don't follow the tow plane, um, you will follow it eventually, right? Because it's attached to you. <laughs> so uh, you're going to go outside of the turn and this is like water skiing or like, uh, you know, putting your kids on the tube and trying to flick them off on the, on the boat. So um, it, it can create a lot of line tension and that line tension will be transferred to performance to the uh, glider and that's going to cause the glider to accelerate and to climb. And in fact, um, uh, Armand, is it, I guess, for a private pilot, do they do a slack line demo on private pilot as well, or is that just a commercial maneuver? Um, no, it's, uh, I'm not sure if uh, he I got to go back to the PTS and look and see if there's slack line that's required in the PTS, slack line taking it out in the PTS. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I'd have to go back. I mean, we train for it. So yeah. if, uh, as you recall, I mean, we, we trained for it uh, when you got your glider add on. Yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure it's in the PTS. I know that boxing the wake is in the PTS. Okay. Um, Cool. Yeah, well, I think that's that's something that obviously we all want to try. And this is actually the best technique to set up for that maneuver, which is to create a slack line recovery, uh, is to go uh, high above the glider or to go outside of a turn and then dive back towards the uh, towards the tow plane. And that can create some some uh, uh, slack line. So uh, actually kind of a good way to set that up. So when we talk slack line, it's just we've risen too high and now we're gaining performance on the tow plane. Uh, in a couple of ways, right? We either shot to the outside of a turn or we were too high and we, we dove back down towards the, uh, the toe and that will create a slack line. Um, there's, there's things that can cause natural slack lines, right? We can induce one ourselves, which is kind of fun to fix, but um, uh, things that can happen naturally would be an abrupt power reduction by the toe plane. I can imagine an engine failure by a toe plane would be pretty drastic and you would see that um, as, a, as a slack. And Jeff, I think you, on that, Cross country tow, you actually ended up releasing because of this issue, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, it, it was actually, I was planning on releasing about that time, but it made it a little more urgent. Yeah, yeah I asked the, the pilot to um, slow down some because, like we were talking about earlier, it felt a little uncomfortable in the turbulence at that speed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he pulled the power instead of just pitching up some. And it was, it was quite dramatic and quite immediate. Yeah. A big, yeah. big bow in the line. Yeah, if the power, if the plane, if the tug reduces power at all, you are going to have slack line. There's just no other way around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, were you concerned about that that uh, slack line actually reaching behind your wing at all? Was it that big, or how how dramatic was it? It, it could have been. Um, I climbed up as I saw it occurring and pulled the release before it, it went back uh, to a position where it could get the the, the wing. But that is definitely a danger. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We could also get a slack line during a uh, aero toe descent. So obviously, if we're, if we're doing uh, recovery from another airport and, and we decide to follow the tow, uh, the tow plane into another airport during a descent, we're probably going to have a much better uh, descent profile and much more efficiency during that descent. So that could create a slow line. Obviously, if we turn inside the, the tow plane radius, um, that'll create a slack line. Up drafts and down drafts, uh, different air masses. Obviously, we're going to react to those up drafts and down drafts and thermals differently, and we're much more efficient. So that could that could cause a slack line, um, or an abrupt recovery from a from a wake or a box corner position could certainly change things as well. In order to fix a slack line, we uh, are advised to slip back into alignment. We talk about slips in the aerodynamic portion, but um, you know, just creating a little bit of cross control. 
uh, aileron one way and rudder the other can create enough drag to slip us back into alignment. Um, or also careful use of the speed brake. It, that one would have to be very, very delicate indeed because the second we throw those speed brakes, again, we get a pitching moment change and creates a lot of drag. So that would be something that might, uh, um, you could, I'd be really careful about. You could probably create enough uh, retention in there that it would break that. Again, if at any time you lose sight of that tow plane, uh, if, it, if the slack's excessive or if you can no longer see the tow plane, then we release immediately. I'd like to just add one thing here, if I may. Uh, yep. The glider flying handbook does show a slip back into alignment, uh, and that's the way I was trained uh, and when I got to trained in glider in Texas. Uh, but here in Boulder, we use a different technique. Uh, let your flight instructor uh, do that technique, but um, we use a different technique here in Boulder, both at mile high and at the club. Uh, but the slipping back into alignment is um, what the book, what the glider flying handbook says. So, yeah, I, I think that technique that you're referring to, Armand, it almost looks like if you if you held a rope in your hand and and kind of took your hand and looped it really fast, it kind of puts a big loop in the uh, in there. And it it's an interesting technique where you can sort of do this so like head nod and point back towards the glider. Uh, and it can very, if you time it right, it very, very gracefully takes up the slack and uh, allows you to fall back into line. So yeah, something that's better demonstrated, I think it's kind of hard to describe, but I always thought of it as kind of like flicking the rope. Cool. One of the maneuvers that we'll do, uh, obviously on the check ride is, and we'll do it in practice, is uh, boxing the wake. Boxing the wake is a great uh, practice because it allows us to uh, understand where this wake is and uh and the effects uh of our position on the on the tow plane very important before you start boxing the wake please let your tow pilot know um, that could be very unnerving again if we get ourselves out of position they may think that we're trying to tell them that we don't want to turn or do something different or that we're just having trouble with controllability of the aircraft um i i hear it's quite a bit of rudder pressure to fly straight when we're out here in one of these corner positions so uh please let the the tow plane know that you're gonna you're gonna box the wake before you before you start to start this maneuver, we're gonna be in a normal toe position and we're gonna go through the, the wake. So you're gonna go through that significant verbal until it gets clear again. And that's the low toe position. From that position, you can either go left or right. It really doesn't matter. You just really uh, start turning the aircraft and move to one of the corner positions. And you can see here in this graphic that we're gonna have significant rudder and be cross-controlled in order to do this. Again, remember we're attached to the toe plane by the nose. So it's trying to, to pull us back into line with the toe plane. So you will be slightly cross-controlled here. And then from that position, we wanna go up, pause, uh, come all the way across to the, to the left corner pocket, all the way down to the low toe position. And then returning to center, we wanna to return to this low toe position. And that's really actually pretty easy. We can simply release the controls uh, and the toe plane more or less is gonna pull us back into the low toe position. And then we very carefully come up through the wake back to the normal high toe position. So uh, that's something you'll do several times in training, but um, kind of a fun exercise. And again, as we make our way around this invisible verbal, if, if at any point you find yourself, uh, you know, what you think is a, an outside position, but you're still feeling the verbal, you might not be too far out. Um, Armand, would you say that the, the, that people typically overdo this or underdo this maneuver when they're reaching these corner positions? Um, you know, uh, I don't want to get too deep into this because it's more flight training than it is ground school. But um, more often than not, what I see students do is round off the corners and then they, they or they get pulled, you know, they tend to drift back towards center Mm -hmm. uh, because the tow the tow plane's always trying to pull you back to center, and um, so sometimes I see, you know, kind of a curved, uh, not a nice, neat, sharp corner, but they just kind of put like a J in there, and then also I see, you know, getting pulled back to center. Those are those are the two most predominant mistakes once they overcome the. You know, it's it's a bit unnerving when you first try this. It's it's kind of scary. Um, yeah. Once you do it a few times, it's like, oh, there's no big deal. But um, it is a little bit unnerving, and and uh, so sometimes students get a little shaky when they first start doing it. Uh, 
but uh, it's the rounding off the rounding off the corners and getting letting yourself get pulled back towards center that seems to be the hardest part of it perfect great again this maneuver we want to do this outside the traffic pattern if we're close into the airport we want to pay attention to other traffic here and make sure we do this well above a thousand feet uh, so that we have time to recover in case we in case we mess it off one of the things that I just want to point out, we're not going to go through this, but there's a significant portion of this chapter that goes through ground launch takeoffs. I don't think it's applicable to uh, to either club uh, or the uh, or mile high operations, but uh, that could be something you could be questioned about. Um, a lot of the details are, are relatively the same, but it's important to understand that there are ground launch options available. Uh, those could be done by an automobile, uh, which would be pretty, pretty neat. So <laughs> just a, just a static line attached to a truck. Um, you could also be a winch launch. A winch is just a usually uh, gas powered or hydraulic powered uh, uh, spool that runs at a specified pressure that pulls uh, the glider up really, really rapidly. And if you've, if you've never seen video of a winch launch, that's, that's uh, pretty exciting. And then of course, self-launch with a motor. I think one of the important takeaways from, from this section of uh, chapter seven is to understand that we do have uh, max uh, ground launch speeds, air speeds, because what can happen is we can get ourselves in a position where the wind gradient, remember, could be it could be significantly windier uh, up here than it is uh, down low. So there's a very important calculation that you want to do where you estimate uh, the difference in that gradient, and then you also give yourself a safety margin. So if our max, uh, you know, max ground launch tow speed was 70 knots. Um, we want to do that math and we might have to tell our driver to, to, to drive a little bit slower than that 50 or 55 miles an hour. So um, very important also to convert to units, right? Because we're probably in knots and that are probably in miles an hour. So um, interesting section if you want to read on that. Uh, I don't have any experience doing it. The, the previous owner of my glider actually used to use uh, automobile launching quite a bit, um, which I think was, was pretty neat. One thing to note though with ground launches is uh, you need to have what's called a CG hook or a center of gravity hook in order to, to be able to do uh, those very effectively. Um, so uh, most of those operations will be set up so that it's pulling from the center of the aircraft rather than from the nose of the aircraft. And Armand, I don't know, is it possible to, to do like a winch launch with something like an ASK that only has, uh, it's only equipped with a aero tow hook? Uh, it's got to have a CG hook to do a winch launch. And yeah. one of the, you know, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, you, you want the towing from the, the center. You don't want the nose pulled around. So you want it from the CG. But yeah. the other more critical uh, feature of the CG hook is it has a back release. Mm -hmm. So if the glider overflies the winch or overflies the tow car, then it releases automatically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good point. Well, that's that's an important safety uh, reason to use the uh, CG hook. Is Great. these release if you overfly. Excellent. Um, all right. So uh, with an aero tour and a normal release, there's a couple of things we're looking for before we release. We want to have normal tension. That's kind of an important part. Uh, some of these aero tow releases um, need a little bit of tension in order to release cleanly. So if you if you find that you have a lot of slack line, it, it will probably release, but it's better to release under normal tension so that that, uh, that tow string comes out normally. Before we release, we want to look right because that's where we're going to go. So always clear your traffic pattern and, and make sure you know where you're going to go and then execute the release. And that release, we're going to turn right. So as you release, you'll probably see that tow line uh, rapidly shrink away as it uh, as it comes away from the uh, the nose of the sailplane and we want to turn right in this case the the tow plane is going to turn left uh, and is going to begin a descent so um, it, I think it's usually pretty obvious but I've definitely heard stories of gliders sneaking off uh, tow and the tow pilot didn't realize that they were off so always good to make a radio call there as well because you're you're the one paying for the tow so if they go fly another 2000 feet before they realize that you're not attached anymore. You just probably paid for a big tow in that case. So uh, important to do that. Great. So um, we'll talk about uh, approaches and landings here. And I think it's, I think it's great, uh, great to remember every, every takeoff is optional. Every uh, landing is mandatory. You know, if it's a bad day to fly, 
uh, we want to make that decision before we take off because once we're airborne, uh, we're going to be landing eventually, no matter what. Um, and that landing could happen almost immediately after takeoff, uh, and that would happen with a rope break. So this is a this this video. Let's watch this uh, together if I can get this to work. Um, this is a great detail, and this actually is a great summation of everything that we've seen up to this point. Can you all see that video screen? Yes, it's coming through. Yes. Okay, great. Again, this was put in by, uh, this was made by Clemens. And so what we're gonna see here is we're gonna see those, uh, those takeoff decision points, um, straight ahead, Elliott's field, L-shaped field, emergency return, and keep a close eye on the altimeter. I'd also like you to notice in the videos, um, his stick displacement. So this is a pretty normal day, light winds, maybe some crosswind here. Uh, but you'll see how aggressive uh, he can be during that initial roll with the stick to make sure the wings stay level, but how careful he is in the pitch axis to make sure that, uh, that he doesn't balloon and that he stays in a proper position. And then really the last thing to look at in the videos is to, to watch that center line tracking. This is a great video because it shows exactly that crab angle that's required to stay in a proper position immediately after liftoff. So let's, uh, let's step through this and I'll pause it uh, a couple of times for comments. Fields. Oh, this one lady. So a couple of things to point out here. This is the the rock quarry that we were that we were looking at. We can also see he's just a little over 200 feet AGL at this case. So typically, if you're in this position, you could make a 180 degree turn with a with a glass ship at least, uh, or something like the ASK 21 and make it back to the field. One of the things that was pointed was you know uh, 180 degree turn depending on the wind. It's important to understand that you know we would want to turn into the wind initially. Uh, so that we don't uh, blow away from the field, you know, so that we have a very small turn radius, uh, because we're going to have to do a 180 degree turn and uh, then correct and land on final. So uh, if it's light wind, it probably doesn't matter. We typically will practice a left hand turn here just to make sure we're not uh, turning back into runway eight powers uh, uh, upwind leg. But um, keep in mind that in a true emergency, if it was blowing very, very hard out of the south here, you'd actually want to make your initial turn to the right so that you had a small turn radius across the ground so that you didn't get blown out of the traffic pattern.
Cool. So we saw a straight ahead landing there. Keep in mind that, um, you know, if you're airborne and the rope breaks and you have no option, but you can still land straight ahead, um, you, you're going to quickly be running out of room in Boulder. Uh, it sits on a plateau. And so we want to make sure that we can get back down. So, um, you know, uh, you saw him in that example go uh, to his air brakes pretty quickly. And then, uh, and then land. Also keep in mind too, that that edge of the field is, is relatively rough. It doesn't get used very much. So expect a, maybe a rougher landing in the turf than you would expect uh, on the west side. Great. Uh, so Elliott's Field, um, which I believe is named after uh, the local examiner, because uh, I think he's the only one that's ended up in that field. Uh, it very, very hard to see. And you can see there that decision point there where running out of room and, and, and going to go off the end of the uh, uh, of the plateau at Boulder. We actually make a slight right turn, stay efficient, keep the air brakes in until you can see the field visually. And then there'll be a left hand base entry into Elliott's Field, which is parallel to the uh, to the road and driveway. It runs north south. Fields. Uh, this one lady.
Great. So I hope that uh, I hope that helps. Uh, I think that's really uh, positive to be able to to look at that. And Condor again is a really great tool uh, for anybody that uh, that has access to that to try those to try those same maneuvers. And uh, and I think uh, uh, practicing those will will really prepare you for that uh, potential low break. Let's see if I can get back to my tab here. Cool. Um, so uh, I think we've talked about that. Obviously, uh, based on wind, we'll make our, our best judgment. Preparing for landing, we want to go through a landing checklist. And there's a couple of options. Of course, uh, again, in the, uh, in the club gliders, we have our uh, landing checklist, wind. Uh, we want to make sure that we have uh, the component we expect, water. Uh, we can check on the water and make sure, uh, obviously, that, uh, that it uh, jives with that as well. And I think this water could also be a good reminder if you were ballasted to uh, try not to land ballasted. Under carriage down, if you're flying retractable of your aircraft, speed set uh, with the proper additive. Uh, trim set to fly hands off at that speed. Air brakes, we wanna check those. We wanna look around. We want to determine our landing surface. We wanna identify any traffic. Again, make sure our airspeed is set and then set our touchdown target. The FAA offers a little bit different uh, monomic to use here. Um, uh, full stall, F-U-S-T-A-L-L, -L. flaps if applicable, undercarriage, down and lock, speed, uh, normal approach speed is recommended by uh, the conditions or the uh, pilot handbook. Set your trim, air brakes, check for operation, landing area, look for other aircraft, wind and uh, personnel, and then of course land the glider. It's important when beginning an approach into uh, any airport to determine an IP or an initial point. The initial point is just a, uh, a reasonable place uh, and an altitude to enter and allows us to enter the downwind leg. So the IP might be here. And in this case, it might go straight to the downwind. Again, it's different for every airport, but uh, in Boulder, we typically have an IP that's uh, south uh, of the airport outside of the tow pattern, um, kind of over the industrial area. And from there, we typically fly at about a thousand feet AGL over the airport. And from that point, you can make a turn to the right or to the left for a landing on runway eight or runway two six. So typically we'll land a glider eight. Uh, we wanna keep the approach close to the runway. Keep in mind that you want to maintain that 45 degree angle to your touchdown point. If you imagine looking out your, uh, looking at your canopy and creating a 45 degree cone, you typically wanna stay within that cone uh, so that you don't get too far away. Um, glider 8 is 4,000 feet long. It's eight 500-foot strips end-to-end, -end, so you don't have to land on the very end. And in fact, there could be significant sink uh, over this portion uh, of the approach, over the trees. Uh, of course, lakes um, don't heat at the same rate as the land does. So a lot of times, you'll get thermal activity over the land. And then especially during the early part of the day, you'll get significant sink uh, over the lake as those thermals cycle at a different rate. Um, Important to understand that you may have to change runways. We really have two runways here. We've got Glider 8, which is here, and then we've got the normal uh, runway 8. There's actually sort of three strips, if you think of it that way. There's the paved strip, there's the dirt strip, and then there's the, the paved runway, any three of uh, which are available to land. We shouldn't have simultaneous operations with uh, power operations. So technically, if we're on final, um, we shouldn't be overtaken by uh, power on eight. However, I've obviously seen that happen uh, quite a few times. Um, your approach needs to be high enough so that if you were standing on the ground, it would appear that your approach is over the mountains. Um, if you come skimming over these trees really low, you're really playing a dangerous game. You may not end up with enough energy to make it all the way to the runway. And uh, be very, very careful of north winds, which is pretty common here, as we have this north uh, turn, uh, this base leg to final from the north, it's very easy to overshoot. Keep in mind that during that turn, you want to stay completely coordinated. If during this turn, you consistently see that the uh, yaw string is off to one side, either in a slip or a skid, it means that we haven't properly coordinated with that turn to final, which can be very dangerous. Uh, as we do line up, we may have to prepare for a uh, crosswind landing. Keep in mind that for any crosswind landing, we have two techniques and really a combination of those techniques that will allow us to land uh, appropriately in a crosswind. And that would be a crab and a slip. So a crab, again, is that kind of walking sideways 
uh, stance that we have. We just point the nose into the wind uh, a, a bit, and then we fly a straight track down the runway. So if we had a component from the north, we'd want to turn just slightly to the north uh, from east and allow us to track right down that runway. Um, however, we don't want to land in a crab uh, scenario because that will significantly sideload the gear and could lead to us grabbing a wing on landing. So we need to convert that to a slip. In the slip, that will be a cross control maneuver where we'll put the aileron down into the wind and then use the rudder to align the uh, longitudinal axis with the runway. Keep in mind though, that as we, as we uh, slip the aircraft, there is significantly higher drag because um, we are seeing more of the cross section of the fuselage in this case. So be prepared for that. Also keep in mind that we use slips um, to our advantage. And there's really two types of slips that you may be asked to describe the difference between. One of those is a forward slip and the other one's a side slip. Um, it, they're, they're actually functionally the same. I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to distinguish uh, between a forward slip and a side slip, except for it's all about really where you're landing. In a forward slip, we're on the left-hand side there, we're showing uh, more of the fuselage to the side, but we're keeping our ground track exactly the same. So uh, in this case, you could differentiate it because uh, the ground track is staying the same all the way through the maneuver, but we are uh, showing the side surface area of the glider through this maneuver. A side slip, actually, the longitudinal axis is going to be aligned with a runway through this, but we'll be moving either upwind or downwind based on the bank angle. So a side slip, we are actually changing our target uh, in this maneuver on the ground. It's very important to keep in mind um, uh, the concept of a stabilized approach. Um, this is not from uh, this is not from a glider. This is from an Airbus. Um, but, but keep in mind that, you know, we have very important stabilized approach uh, policies in other aircraft types. It's because a, a go around is always an option, but it's not an option in the glider here. So we want to make sure that we meet some of these same criteria. Some of the things that we look for to, to make sure we have a uh, stabilized approach is a steady rate of descent. You're on the correct path uh, all the way throughout. You're in the final landing configuration, landing gear, flaps, and in this case, air brakes. Air brakes, um, depending on the aircraft type, you know, they can, they can be very effective or very ineffective, but I think it's uh, important to establish an air brake setting and really try to keep that same setting all the way through your final approach uh, so that you're not chasing it. If you're trying to vary your, your speed and your flight path with the use of air brakes, um, you're probably not configured appropriately, and that's going to create a lot, of, uh, a lot of difficulty landing in a predictable spot. We want to make sure that uh, we don't have any uh, any other warnings or cautions, you know, if you, if you spook yourself by your sync rate, then that's probably too much. We want to have a steady sync rate and we want to be within our target speed all the way through, uh, through some of that. So as you, as you think about the type of aircraft that you fly, you want to keep in mind, what are some of the, the standard operating procedures that you can employ and that you can check time after time after time to make sure that you're following uh, a same, uh, similar approach policy. Cool. So uh, if, if you had to land on the main runway in Boulder, be sure to stay on the center line and don't turn off. Uh, the main runway can be landed on if needed and don't uh, hesitate it, uh, to use it if the, other, uh, if the other runways are blocked. One thing to keep in mind, we really kind of consider this runway uh, two parts. Um, there's the portion on the west end that the, the SSB typically lands on. There's actually a mark on the other end uh, over by the mile high shack that sort of delineates uh, the section of runway that they're going to begin on. And typically, if they have a glider out there, as long as we follow a stabilized approach and we don't have excessive energy, we can easily land in the first half of the runway uh, without having to resort to the main runway. However, if you do land on the main runway, make sure that you're, you make a radio call saying you're landing on the main runway and then keep the aircraft on the center line. Uh, it's very important to understand that uh, the runway itself is 23 meters wide and it's got uh, lights and signs on all sides. Um, and, uh, you know, the ASK and the 505 are 20 meter ships. So, uh, very little clearance on each side. Um, the main runway also has a lip, uh, keeping it above ground. So don't roll it off and don't hit a don't hit a light. Also, that uh, that 
the side of the runway can be very, very soft. So you want to be careful not to, uh, not to push a glider off of that. It's better to go all the way down to the West end, uh, in order to get back to the staging area. Having the hardest time getting this to advance. All right, so um, again, our approach speed, make sure that we add uh, some speed increment. Typically we add five knots to the triangle, uh, but if it's windy or rough air, a good rule of thumb is ha the, uh, half the wind and all the gust to the approach speed in order to account for the climb gradient. Um, we can see the uh, breakdown of the three different runways here. Uh, you can see that you could actually fit three 18 meter gliders, wingtip to wingtip between the, um, the main runway and the dirt runway and the, uh, the main runway. Uh, you could land on the grass. Um, if you do land on the grass, be sure to keep the stick back and the nose high to keep the rocks from kicking up uh, too high. Um, and then also, if someone lands on the dirt runway, uh, there's very little wingtip clearance between that and the main runway. So that's why we keep the south wing down during staging uh, to make sure that if someone does land on the grass runway, that there's enough wingtip clearance to go over the top of it. Uh, if possible, land and stop the aircraft uh, on the glider runway. Otherwise, close the spoilers and fly past the aircraft on the ground before touching down and uh, clear the runway as quickly as you can. Um, let's see, we covered that. Uh, oh, this is a great point. If, uh, if you see somebody land, especially if they're, they're by themselves, uh, please go out and help them as quickly as you poss as possibly can. It can be very difficult to, to move these gliders by yourself. Bring a handheld radio and uh, watch for traffic. And if it's uh, one of the club, uh, the DG, uh, or one of the discuses, then please bring the tail dolly out uh, to help, help move that around. The last part of chapter seven covers uh, what we call performance and performance maneuvers. And, and we'll kind of run through these uh, uh, quickly so that you have an understanding of what's expected there. Uh, this is from the PTS. So some of the performance maneuvers required for the private are straight glides, turns to heading, and uh, steep turns. Straight glide actually sounds pretty straightforward, but it's just a glide at a constant airspeed and heading. Um, it's important through your training to make sure that you learn to fly through a wide range of airspeeds uh, from minimum controllable airspeed all the way up to, uh, to your maximum airspeed. The, the examiner will be looking for um, some of the common errors here. The common errors in a straight glide would be a rough or erratic pitch attitude and airspeed control, rough, uncoordinated or inappropriate applications of uh, flight controls, failure to trim the aircraft properly, uh, improper use of controls, including spoilers, brakes, uh, dive to brakes and flaps, or prolonged uncoordinated flight uh, with the uh, yaw string or the ball nut centered. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that uh, we we want to make sure that that string stays straight, and uh, in order to correct it. Um, you would step on the head of the, the string to correct an out of trim situation. Uh, we'll also do turns to a heading. This is a maneuver that requires uh, coordinated use of ailerons, rudder and elevator. And probably the biggest thing here and, and the easiest way to bust this maneuver would be to not clear the airspace. So very important before you begin a turn, uh, look to the side and make sure that the uh, airspace that you're turning into is clear. Uh, remember that a turn is really just a blend of the vertical lift component and the horizontal lift component that turns uh, that, uh, that acts as the, the, the horizontal component of lift that allows us to turn the aircraft. We would consider a shallow turn, something like 20 degrees, a medium turn up to 45 degrees, and a steep turn, 60 degrees. So be sure through this maneuver that we uh, clear our turns. Um, we want to make sure that we do this in a coordinated way. Um, every aircraft is different, and it really depends on the speed at which you fly the aircraft. Some aircraft require uh, you to lead with the ailerons and follow with a rudder. Uh, some are rudder than ailerons. And again, uh, even the same aircraft can exhibit different behavior depending on the airspeed or the flap setting. So uh, you'll just uh, you'll learn that in training uh, how to begin that uh, that coordinated. So. Um, we want to make sure that we establish and maintain our desired angle of bank, whatever was asked for, and then be uh, prepared to roll out appropriately so that we don't overshoot or undershoot our desired heading. Uh, steep turns at 60 degrees. This is something that you'll do, and it's important to uh, understand the effects 
of uh, load factor, stall speed, and overbank tendency uh, in a steep turn and discuss those. Obviously, you want to establish the recommended uh, entry speed, whatever, whatever they ask you to do, and then uh, enter the turn, maintaining um, uh, your bank angle uh, as appropriate. And Armand, is there a different standard here uh, between private and commercial that you know of, or is that all? Yes, indeed. Um, for the private, you have to be plus or minus 10 knots on the uh, bank angle and plus or minus 10 knots, plus or minus 10 knots on the speed and plus or minus 10 degrees on the bank angle. For commercial, you have to be able to fly plus or minus five knots on the speed and plus or minus five degrees on, on the bank angle. Cool. You know, one of the great things about steep turns in a glider uh, that, that you uh, makes it easier, I think, than if you're flying power is you don't have to maintain altitude. So that's a that's a plus. <laughs> so you just maintain your airspeed and bank angle and everything works out great. Well, uh, it's, much, and, it's much more of a plus if you're in a lift and you thermal and okay. you do those steep turns in the thermal and you go up to daisy. That's that's much better. That'd be that'd be a great, great way to demonstrate that. So, yeah. and then of course we've made it within uh, 10 degrees of our desired heading. So don't, don't get enamored with your turn and keep turning and turning and turning. Be sure to, to uh, exit at the appropriate spot. Cool. All right. Some other concepts that are important for us to understand is uh, maneuvering at minimum control airspeed. So uh, we will do some small turns at MCA. Just keep in, in mind that minimum control of airspeed is the speed at which any further increase in angle of attack or load factor would cause an immediate stall. So we're, we're just above really the verbal uh, in this. And it's actually a really uh, delicate and fun maneuver. Um, this is one where you may find uh, requires a little more finesse on the rudder in order to, uh, to execute this uh, easily. But again, air aircraft's a little bit differently. Uh, but we wanna be very, very smooth and very gentle throughout this uh, maneuver. Uh, and then stalls. So uh, stalls are funny. And if you look up the definition of a stall, there's just, there's a ton there. Um, the airplane flying handbook, I think, um, sums it up nicely. And I think I could even summarize it more as a stall is when the aircraft exceeds a critical angle of attack. Again, it's very important for us to understand the difference in airspeed and angle of attack and then their relationship to a stall. Um, really an aircraft can stall at any airspeed. Um, and we talked a little bit about that in the aerodynamic section about high speed stalls and uh, obviously low speed stalls and coffin corners and those sorts of things. But it really has to do with uh, load factor and the respective angle of attack. But the definition from the airplane flying handbook uh, is pretty succinct and it says as the AO increases, lift and drag increase. However, above a wing's critical angle of attack, again, that flow separates from the surface and backfills, burbles, and eddies, which is the buffet that we talk about, and creates a reduction in lift and an increase in drag. This condition is a stall, which can lead to loss of control if AOA is not reduced. So we can always recover from a stall in any aircraft type by reducing the angle of attack immediately. Um, there's some other terms associated with stall, secondary stall. A secondary stall is simply when you had a stall, you recover from it, and then in your recovery, you were too quick to reapply load factor to the aircraft too, too quick to recatch it and you experienced a secondary stall. So again, it's the same thing as a stall, it's just the second time that you stalled. If you do a stall recovery, it's very important to hold that recovery, reduce the angle of attack long enough to give yourself enough margin that when you reapply load in that case, it doesn't enter a secondary stall. An accelerated stall is again, just a stall, but it indicates at a higher indicated airspeed and could be the factor of a steep turn rough pull-ups or abrupt changes in flight path. Um, again, you can stall an aircraft at any speed and it's really just about reaching that critical angle of attack, which if you're, if you're going fast and you pull really hard, you can stall uh, it at a very high indicated airspeed, which is gonna be technically an accelerated stall, uh, but it's gonna happen very, very rapidly because you're gonna go from lots of margin to no margin really quickly. So that's a, it's a very accelerated entry too and can also be a little bit more difficult to recover from because it happens so quickly. Keep in mind some signs of an impending stall are uh, attitude. Attitude, because our wings are directly attached to the fuselage, uh, we can kind of sense that AOA uh, just through our pitch attitude um, and in uh, those trends. 
uh, low airspeed indication with a decreasing trend, low noise, you know, right before the stall, it gets very, very quiet. Uh, the back pressure is increasing, requiring more elevator trim or not having any more aft trim. Maybe you're all the way against the stops. The glider gets really mushy here. So you would notice poor control responses from the glider and decreasing feedback from our control movements. Everything gets really sluggish here. And then as we develop into the stall, you'll get wing and airframe buffeting as the stall begins. Uh, and then your yaw string is also an indication uh, of a stall because it, it's not going to have enough dynamic pressure to hold it in a, in a nice clean way, uh, but we'll kind of burble side to side. Another definition here uh, that you'll be expected to talk about is operating speeds. There's some very important operating speeds here. And the first definition here is minimum sink airspeed. And it's important to understand that minimum sink is the speed at which the glider loses the least amount of altitude in a given period of time. So if we wanted to stay up all day long, uh, we would go fly around at minimum sink, sink if we were just you know, hanging out above the airport. So minimum sink is relational really to time only. If we're thermaling, we want to be at minimum sink because um, uh, that will give us the slowest descent rate in a parcel of air that's climbing. So over time, it will give us the best climb rates. However, keep in mind that we do have to fly minimum sink corrected for load factor while thermaling. And there's a, there's a great exercise I recommend you all to do and go figure out the stall speed now by determining the square root of the load factor at your given bank angle. But if you're not that interested in doing the math, just kind of keep in mind uh, that the, um, the approximate increases uh, in the type of aircraft that you'll fly during training is, you know, a 30 degree bank, you need to add three to five knots, 45 degree bank, seven to 10 knots and 60 degree bank, you know, maybe nine or 11 knots. So you'll also feel that while thermaling. And also keep in mind, as you read through this performance section, there's some very, very detailed charts and some very detailed formulas, which are great to understand from a theoretical perspective. Uh, but again, uh, you're going to, you're going to feel a lot of this in that thermal. So it becomes really second nature and you can tell if, uh, if your bank angle and your load factor exceed what you can, um, what you can handle at that, uh, at that speed, you're going to start to feel the burble of an impending stall. And that's, that's actually uh, kind of relatively calm or common on a, on a rough day. Um, the other uh, thing that we want to understand is the definition of best glide airspeed or lift over drag max. So that's uh, Commonly, what we see uh, on the polars is our is our glide ratio, and this results in the least amount of altitude loss over a given distance on the ground. The glide ratio decreases at air speeds above or below best glide. So, um, when we determine that best glide through that exercise that we showed from the tan tangent, right, that will give us our LD max, and that gives us a resultant speed and sink rate. Any speed above that is a higher drag profile, and any speed below that is going to be uh, to be more drag. Um, however, um, we want obviously if we we're moving into a big headwind, right? We we probably don't want to just fly at LD max and then lose ground over that headwind. So a good rule of thumb is to add half the headwind component to LD max, uh, and then for a tailwind, do the same thing: remove uh, that speed, uh, half the tailwind to LD max. However, we never want to fly below minimum sink because uh, if we fly below minimum sink, the drag profile will get very steep and we'll, we'll have excessive drag in that. I, this, this could be an interesting conversation with an examiner uh, and you want to make sure that you understand that this, again, results in the least amount of altitude loss over a given distance in reference to the ground. So if you're trying to fly uh, between two points on the ground, you'd want to consider LD max and the... Uh, the additives to a headwind or a tailwind. However, Armand and I were talking earlier and he had a great point. He said, listen, if you're just cloud flying, right? And you're flying uh, in between clouds, you wouldn't consider this uh, headwind or tailwind component because um, you're not referencing the ground anymore. You're flying in the same air mass as the clouds are. So in that case, again, we'd wanna just fly our best glide speed. All right, and this all kind of culminates in a, a reference called uh, speed to fly. And there, there really is a practical application of speed to fly. Speed to fly, um, the objective of speed to fly is to minimize the, the amount of time and or altitude required to fly from the current position 
uh, to the next thermal, uh, and then minimize our time in sync and maximize our time in lift. So we said that any speed above LD max is going to be higher drag, and we but we can see that by flying faster um, sometimes than what might be optimum, if we're flying uh, to another expected thermal, we'll get there. Uh, maybe lower, but we'll get there quicker and be able to make that up based on uh, the expected climb rate. And this is an important uh, thing to understand when flying cross country or if racing gliders uh, as well. But um, speed to fly is a penetration speed that takes into account atmospheric conditions, including sink and or headwinds. So um, there, there really is an application where you, you'll fly at speeds much, much higher than what would be expected for uh, just looking at the normal polar chart. So um, we typically represent uh, optimum speed to fly through a theory called McCready theory. And McCready was a, a scientist um, in the early days of, uh, of really sailplane racing, I think probably 70s and uh, into the 80s, that was able to devise a mathematical formula that, that basically said, hey, if you expect a climb rate of, uh, in this case, uh, half a meter a second, um, we need to fly a slightly higher speed. And he developed something called a McCready ring. And so typically, uh, you would have a ring on your, on your mechanical variometer that might look like this. And you would set it at zero. And uh, then your, the speed to fly, in that case, to fly optimally uh, between those uh, the distance over the ground or through the day to an expected thermal would be in this case about 105 knots, 106 knots. However, if we were expecting uh, half a meter a second, in this case, that's a meter a second instead of knots, um, then you would fly a little bit faster up to about 115. So that's a quick, easy way to do it. Um, honestly, I've never actually flown with a McCready ring or flown an aircraft that had one in it, but uh, most electronic flight computers now do those calculations for you, which is great because it's a very dynamic uh, speed too. You can imagine that sync uh, between these thermals is typically going to, uh, is going to uh, be constantly changing. And in between the thermals or at the edges, we're gonna get much more sync than we do uh, approaching a thermal or, or uh, entering the core of another one. So the uh, benefit of a flight computer is it can calculate the speed to fly uh, very, very rapidly and can change uh, very quickly. So. Cool. Well, that's 46 slides on chapter seven. So that was uh, that was a quick review, but I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments. I'd like to add a few comments on it. Please. I um, uh, just just as thought out there, you know, as a CFI, I just want to throw a couple of thoughts in there. You know, the 200 foot um, return altitude, of course, is of what we all trained for, but it's, I believe in takeoff and departure briefings, and one of the things to, to consider there is the, how far are you going to be from the field at 200 feet, and does that affect your, your decision on whether you try to go back or go somewhere to one of the alternate fields? And that also leads into the discussion of, well, if you do go back, how much tailwind are you willing to tolerate? Yeah. And that's a, you know, a tailwind will help you get to the field, but once you get on the deck, say you got a 20 knot tailwind, when you get down to close to 20 knots, you have no uh, aileron or rudder. So now your wheel brakes are no skid if you're equipped with one, or yeah. maybe an intentional ground loop. And yeah, speaking of intention, intentional ground loops, I just want to throw that out there. I mean, nobody wants to train for a ground loop, but if you're about to hit something really, really, really hard, and, and that's the only thing you've got left, you know, it's probably better to ground loop and sacrifice the airplane for the sake of the occupants. Another yeah. thought I wanted to throw out too is on a, uh, if you have an abort on a, uh, you know, a termination where you're still right on the deck, if the tow plane is not going around, say he has had an engine failure, he's supposed to go left, the rider's supposed to go right, you know, assuming there's room. And on the traffic pattern, I'll just say, of course, show the standard pattern, but if whatever, if it's not working, you know, you're getting a bunch of sinks or whatever, you need to make it work by, you know, shortening the pattern or whatever you've got to do. And I did uh, post the link for that as well on the chat box. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, the, uh, the, <laughs> the 200 foot return is a really tough one. I mean, being a power pilot, I mean, you know, we actually train completely different power, right? That there, there is no altitude in a powered airplane, a single engine G airplane that you can safely do a 180 degree turn and make it back to the airfield, right? And that's, 
that's called the dangerous turn. And it's a, it's an interesting concept because in a powered airplane, you know, if you're flying a Mooney or a Bonanza or something like that, your climb gradient is never, your forward speed is too high and your climb gradient is too low to ever effectively make it back to the airport. And that can lead to a stall spin incident or accident, obviously. Um, and so it was interesting coming to a glider and being capable of making those 200 foot turns. And we, I don't know, Armand and I didn't do it quite that low, but you know, maybe 300 feet. And it's incredible to see um, that, that the performance capability of a, of a sailplane is that just that much better where it actually does open that up as an opportunity. But Danny, you make a great point that, you know, turning back into a face full of traffic in Boulder is going to be, you're going to have a whole new set of problems on your hands, right? I mean, you could have mile high that's pulling a, pulling a glider right behind you and you're going face to face with them and power traffic as well. So not only the tailwind component, but the traffic component is something to consider. And I remember a lot of times in my training where Armand and I just couldn't do the maneuver because it just got too busy. So that's a, that's a great point. If I could throw in as a new tow pilot, um, one of the, the things that I was taught um, is to start a turn back towards the field earlier if we haven't uh, achieved enough altitude. And so we're kind of starting that maneuver for you as a glider pilot in a way. So trying not to get too far out from the field before starting a turn back. So, you know, there's still going to be a critical point where you're not able to to turn back possibly, but it's not going to be as long. We're not going to fly out and get you at 200 feet, you know, half a mile from the airfield. We're going to start that turn back towards the airfield earlier. So at least at Boulder, it's, it's kind of built in a little bit to, to help that, um, that, that critical zone to be, to be less, to be sure. Josh, or Jeff, is there kind of an altitude that you need to be at before you can begin that turn? Because I've definitely been behind on a hot day and heavy where we're, we're just not climbing very well. So they just continue straight out well past the quarry before they begin that turn. And yeah, well, this is what, so at least according to what John taught me, that's incorrect. So if I haven't achieved um, 5,500 feet, by the time I get to the rock quarry, I'm mm. going to start a turn. Okay. If I've achieved 5,500 feet, then um, I'll probably start that turn about at the rock, you know, just past the rock quarry. If I'm getting a really good climb rate, then I'm going to turn even a little further away. Right. And, you know, it's kind of a trade off between deconfliction from other aircraft uh, in the pattern, you know, trying to get as high as possible and also noise. And, and primarily the safety of the glider. And, you know, in theory, I'll take into account, well, if it's K, uh, uh, 21 versus um, the DG, I know the DG is gonna get a little more glide. So I guess uh, you know, the K21, I may start that turn, tend to start it earlier. Cool. I, I haven't had a lot of real world practice with this, but that's what, what he taught me. Yeah, yeah, great points. Thanks guys. Just add in at uh, Tampa Bay soaring, they do the same thing where they start turning and you know, circling the field basically. It's a different set of converging runways and other things going on, but essentially the same deal. If you're getting low and you're getting far away, it's better to start circling back toward the airport. So the guy, the glider, if he does have to, you have to you know, uh, disconnect, he has a, a shot at getting back. Great. Armand, do you know of any, if we had any actual, two to 300 foot rope breaks that someone's turned around and made it back. And do they have any experience with, with that? You know, uh, not that I'm aware of where the rope actually broke. I, I did have a student release, <laughs> release us once, uh, <laughs> which to me sure seemed like a rope break. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, he missed the call, you know, we call it 200 feet that, and he missed the call and, and I said 200 and he reached forward and released. And wow. I was like, ah, oh, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad I didn't call it at 50 feet. Uh, so uh, any rate, uh, yeah. So any rate that to me, that seemed like a real rope break, but um probably the, the rope was still attached. Um, I can't, you know, you talked about the rope break or the situation why Elliot's field is named Elliot's field. Yeah. Uh, and yes, it was Elliot Crawford 
he was flying the uh, 232 doing a ride with two people in the back seat. And uh, the tow plane, for, the tow pilot, for some reason, uh, released them on, you know, shortly after takeoff. And Elliot went for that field uh, with a very heavy glider with three people in it, two, two in the back seat, two, uh, two tourists, if you will, or, you know, ride, ride ease or whatever. And he stuffed it in there. And, you know, that's a very tricky one because you cannot, and as uh, it was talked about in the video that you showed, if you get, if you have a rope break or <laughs> whatever, low like that, um, you cannot see Elliot's field until you get right onto it. So you just have to kind of gulp and believe that it's there and fly towards it and then uh, do what you can to land in it. And it's a tight landing. Uh, the rest of the story with Elliot and uh, with the two people in the back seat, the two uh, tourists, if you will, or, or people getting rides, um, they took off and, and he did that and he, he landed and the two people in the back seat said, Wow, that was really fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think Elliot wanted to do it again. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> right. um, <clears throat> you know, um, so that's, yeah, I'm glad you went over that. That's a, important. And of course, every airport's going to be a little bit different on where those landout fields are going to be. Yeah. But, uh, you need to be you need to be sure of it and and you know when you're doing your pre-launch checklist and you get to the uh, emer you know the, the emergency rope break at low level you need to also say which direction you're going to turn like okay at 200 feet we can turn around and go back don't just say at 200 feet we can turn around and go back say at 200 feet based on the wind today we're going to turn left or based on the wind today we're going to turn right um, if you don't believe that you really should turn into the wind, uh, I suggest that you fly it on Condor in a strong crosswind and turn, make your turn downwind and see how much you like it. And I bet you you won't like it. <laughs> uh, and remember, Condor doesn't have trees and all that. So um, it's, yeah, it's pretty scary. I mean, it, when, you, when you do that turn and you do it downwind, it really blows you away from the airport. Cool. Anybody else with uh, questions or comments on tonight's session? If there's nothing else, uh, there's two things that you talked about a little bit, Casey, that I would like to just kind of go over and make sure that everybody uh, understands it. And one is recognizing the stall and in, um, the FAA wants instructors not so much to teach how to recover from a stall. And yes, you do have to learn how to recover from a stall and you have to be able to demonstrate it on your check ride. But really what's more important is to be able to recognize that the stall is coming. And if you read the latest edition of the Glider Flying Handbook, it says there are seven uh, uh, indications of a stall. I think that's a little overdone. I, I use four. So the first sign of a stall is your nose is up above the horizon. When I say your nose, I mean the glider's nose is above the horizon. And you can see that visually. The next thing you get is with your ear and you can hear that sound of going slow. So you're listening for pitch, not for volume. But when you're going fast in a glider, it makes a whistling, high-pitched whistling sound. And when you get going slow, it makes a low whine. I think we've all heard that. The next sign is, is the feel. And you know, you're, you're, the controls get real sloppy. And then the next sign is you get the buffet. And after the buffet, you get the stall. So the signs of a stall are nose high, low airspeed, sound. So nose high look, airspeed, low airspeed sound, sloppy control feel, feeling the buffet. And then after that, there's a stall. 
Um, being able to recognize that stall is very important. Um, I, I sometimes ask a little bit of a, of a snide question and, and that is, what's the best way out of a stall spin? And the answer is recognize that it's gonna stall and don't let it stall. And so if you don't stall, you won't spin. And um, so uh, I, I think that's important. The, the other thing I'd like to go over, re-go over, and, and you did this speed to fly, and I'd like to try to get everybody here to kind of call out the answer. So if we're flying uh, in still air, no wind, and we're trying to get to the furthest point on the ground, we would fly at everybody. What speed would we fly at? And I'm not looking for a number, I'm looking for an answer. L over D. Best L over, L over D max. Okay, and what about if there's a headwind? How fast would we fly? Eric? L over D max plus half the headwind. Yes. Right. What if there's a tailwind? How fast would we fly? L over D max less a half to a quarter of the tailwind. Down to what speed? What would be the lowest, slowest? Not, we not below right. minimum sink. Right, very good, very good. And now what if we're in lift? How fast should we fly? Eric? Uh, we would fly min sink, right? Because the glider is always sinking. So the glider is even sinking through that air that's rising. It's just the air is rising faster than the glider is sinking. So we have what we call lift. And if we're circling in that lift, uh, we're increasing our load factor. So we have to make an adjustment. And Casey went over those adjustments. Um, so it's about, for a 30 degree bank, it's gonna be about 10% faster. A 45 degree bank, about 40% faster. And a 60 degree bank, about 40% faster. So we would fly min sink adjusted for angle of bank. And if we're in sync, how fast do we fly? And we can, we can give the answer with one word, a guy's name, who Casey talked about. McCready? Yeah, Paul McCready, uh, one of the greatest nerds that <laughs> ever ever walked the face of the earth uh, but he was a very smart guy and he figured it you know and he figured this out for us and and we still use McCready theory today uh, even though he did it you know several decades ago um, so the McCready speed is what we would fly inner thermal or through sink and it depends on the on the on the uh, ability of the glider, the performance of the glider. So a glider with a very uh, flat curve, um, uh, sink curve, uh, we would fly pretty fast through that sink. And other gliders that just create their own sink, if you fly too fast, then you can't fly those as fast through the sink. So the answer is, you know, no wind, best glide. Uh, headwind, best glide plus half the headwind. Tailwind, best glide minus half the tailwind as down to as, but no lower than min sink. Uh, in lift, we would fly min sink corrected for angle of bank. And in and interthermal or in sink, we would fly the McCready speed. So those are, those two concepts are very important when you're gonna take your, your check ride. You need to know those. You need to let the examiner know, you know how to recognize a stall. You recognize a stall is coming, not that you're in a stall, but when you're getting close to the stall and you know what speeds to fly the glider. So um, yeah, I emphasize those, those two concepts a lot in when I do flight training and I guess also when I do ground school. Uh, those are very important things for you to, to really make sure you know.
uh, before you go take your check ride. And Armin, how do you know what the McCready setting is? Well, you would set the McCready setting yourself. And you're, the idea is to set it at what you think is the next lift. So if you okay. think you're going to get, say, five knots of lift at the next thermal, theoretically, if you're really aggressive, you'd set the McCready at five. So you would be flying really fast. And if you're flying really fast and you hit that thermal and it's five knots, life is good. You'll go right up. If you're flying really fast and that thermal isn't there, you, maybe you're going to get to meet a farmer uh, in, a, in a short amount of time. Uh, so, th so then do you um, adjust for the possibility that you're wrong or incorrect on the next thermal by setting instead of five, you'd set it above or below? Below. Below, okay. You set it more conservative okay. uh, if you don't want to meet the farmer. Um, okay. Uh, you know, you still, you still might meet the farmer, but you, you know, the fat, the higher your McCready setting, um, you know, the higher the probability that you're going to land out. Okay. Uh, so, you know, Armand, if you, if you set McCready at zero, is it essentially going to be uh, best glide LD max? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. So it's making adjustments off of LD max uh, in a graphical way to, to give you an indication of that, right? Correct. Cool. Anything else? Michaela, you're our, you're our honorary uh, newest solo student. So have you got anything to uh, talk about here? Um, not really. You guys kind of went over everything that I was kind of queasy on, but um, I really like how you guys explained it. Like just like about the stalls. That really helped because like, I don't know, when I'm flying, it's just, you always got to think about it, you know? It's like, there's so many things you have to think about. <laughs> Does the landings, you know, when you were learning how to land, did things seem to happen kind of fast when you start coming into the pattern? Michaela? Sorry, you kind of broke up in that. Can yeah, you when you, that. Yeah, when you say... Like when you come in, when you were learning to land, did it seem like everything was running really fast? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. When you just like, yeah, I would think it, would, it was going kind of fast when you're learning it. But when I came in for my solo, it seemed a little bit slower, but a little fast at the same time. Yeah. Well, when you do the solo, you kind of have to do it. I mean, it's either you're going to crash and burn or you're going to land nicely and uh, Fortunately, it sounds like you landed nicely, so that's great. Yeah, I landed a little short from where I was supposed to because there's someone on the main runway, oh, and okay. I had to land on the dirt, so I was watching both the tow plane and the other runway and making sure I didn't go in each way, so I kind of landed a little shorter than I wanted to, but I landed pretty well. Good, and you didn't hit anything. That's even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, it... Boulder is a challenging place uh, to fly because there's so much traffic. It's so crowded and, uh, you know, you may turn base and realize that you can't land at, at where you, you know, at your aim point where you wanted to land. You got to pick, you got to pick another spot. And um, so that's, that adds a challenge. So, Way to go, uh, Michaela. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody have anything else to go over? Or if not, we'll uh, we'll have another session, uh, hopefully next Wednesday. Um, Casey and Jeff and I need to go over what the topics are going to be, uh, but this is the third one in the series. Uh, covering the topics in the glider flying handbook. And as you can see, we're not teaching the glider handbook, flying handbook, you know, page by page by page. That would bore me to tears, if not everybody else. And, um, uh, but uh, Jeff and Casey are both very accomplished career pilots. 
Um, they both fly really well. I had the pleasure to uh, train both of them for their glider add-ons. And uh, I didn't really have to teach them how to fly. I just had to show them, you know, what maneuvers you have to do and be able to do in a glider. And, and they learned those very quickly. Uh, so you're getting just tremendous uh, depth of experience and knowledge uh, from them on this ground school. And I and, uh, hope you all enjoy it. And uh, we'll, if there's nothing else, we'll, I guess we'll just see you all next week for sure. session four. And Casey and Jeff, what, I'm sorry, I'm not following. What, what, what are going to be the topics next week? Um, I think if we keep on track, it's going to be, I think Jeff's going to do emergency procedures and I'll do weather. Uh, yeah. I already did emergency procedures. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Weather is, weather is a big topic. And, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, yeah. I would, I would actually like to give the way, the, uh, gra what's actually the scientists call a gravity wave. And uh, so that's the wave that we know about here in Boulder in the wintertime where we go really high and uh, ascend really fast and descend uh, even faster um, and have rotor and all that fun stuff. So, um, but weather is a big, big, big topic. And there's a whole bunch of weather that is glider specific uh, that even, uh, you know, you guys that, that flew airplane a lot, learned a lot about weather. There's some very specific glider stuff. And we're going to, we're going to cover those, those parts of, of glider weather. Uh, and uh, I'm going to insist that I do the, uh, the wave, uh, cause I, it's called gra that scientists call it gravity wave. And I was just perplexed. Why, why is it gravity? What was gravity got to do with it? Um, and so then I started digging in and, and following it from that perspective. So um, I'll do that portion of weather, but you guys need, but there's a lot of other weather and we got to make sure that everybody understands uh, thermal index because thermal index will be on your check ride. And uh, so we've got to make sure we know how to explain thermal index. And uh, so anyway, so Jeff and Casey and I will, huddle here uh, in the next day or two and uh, get the, the weather one. So is there anything beyond weather or is that going to be, uh, is that going to wrap up this series when we do weather? Um, I guess we'll go to the glider flying handbook. That, you can see I what. Uh, I think the next section after that is cross country techniques, which oh, probably, yeah. probably outside. I don't know if you want to include that. That that would be interesting, but maybe maybe that's a two hundred one level course or discussion. Uh, you know, we, we should touch on it because it is in the glider flight handbook. But um, there, we've got a wonderful set of in in the, uh, uh, the you know last spring. We had all these great pilots, these great cross-country pilots in the uh, in the club, and the, a lot of them gave presentations. Uh, that's a lot better than, um, you know, that's really extensive and, and really good stuff. Uh, so we'll probably for the to wrap up this course, we'll we'll touch on it, but I'd really rather just kind of refer everybody to uh, those cross countries. We'll also uh, maybe we'll talk about the height rings because that will come up on the on the check rides. Everybody needs to know how to how to handle the check the uh, those rings. So maybe what we'll do for the uh, uh, cross country portion is uh, you know height rings and okay. kind of show everybody how to do that. Yeah, and we do have human factors as well, which I think would probably be a, a good one to include in the series. Yeah, we better do human factors. So we'll, we'll maybe have two more weeks then to finish cool. this off, two more sessions. So this is session three, it'll probably be five sessions. So. Armin? Yes, sir. Um, sorry for checking back in so many times. I had a computer yeah. glitch. That's okay. And uh, so anyway. Yep. Appreciate yep. it, everybody. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, have guys. a good evening. Thank good you. Night.